All right. Hello and welcome to Gig Performer, the Foundation Series. My name is Brett Pontecorvo. I'm a member of the Gig Performer team, and I'm going to be walking us through this six-week series called Gig Performer Foundations. And I think it's really important. I was mentioning this last week. If you were here last week, why don't you go ahead and hit that like button? But we were we were talking about last week how Gig Performer is so capable it's such a capable program that sometimes we we get you know enamored with the bells and whistles and we need to go back to the foundations go back to sort of the source to really unlock the full power and potential um, that Gig Performer has to offer. Now, as I mentioned before, my name is Brett Pontecorvo. Um, you might know me from Live Keyboardist, a YouTube channel and blog where I help keyboard players with their live setups. Um, and also last week, we were meeting the two co-founders, David um, and Nabosha, who, if you notice from this picture, are actually currently playing their instruments. And I think that's also one of sort of the secrets uh, to why this software is so such a, a breakthrough piece of software is because people who created it created it partially because they needed uh, something solid and easy to use. Um, but anyway, today we are diving into uh, sort of the visual end, the visual take that Gig Performer has um, on live performance software. So I see actually we've got 28 people in the room right now. Um, so if you're here right now, um, why don't you go ahead and let me know what instruments you play? Um, I want to see how many how many piano players, how many guitar players we have. Pop that in the comments. Just let me know um, what instrument it is that you are playing. I guess there's a bit of a delay here on all of that. So while I'm waiting for those to come in, let's just kind of quickly go over um, some of the fundamental things that we were chatting about. So first of all, the goals of a DAW and live performance software are just a little bit different, okay? So the goal of a DAW is a finished recording, and the goal of live performance software is a playable performance. Oh, we've got all these comments coming in. Let's see here. We've got uh, keyboards, um, more keyboards, jazz flute, Jeremy Wong, jazz flute and gig performer. We've got Glenn Short popping in with this guitar, um, keys and guitar. Troy wrote in keys rule. I'm a keys player, so I'm definitely partial um, to the keyboard. Um, all right. So kind of back to what we were doing here. We've got this goal of the DAW being the finished recording and the goal of live performance software being a playable performance. So the fundamental thing that we're trying to accomplish here is very different. And it's one of the reasons why we even need a different solution for performing live because we're trying to do two different things. Okay. So in live performance software, what we really need and what Gig Performer has created is a way for us to get to playing the music quickly because the goal isn't a recording. The goal is you playing the music. So the way we do this is by creating pathways for efficient work. And we talked about this last week, but a lot of the pathways that are created for efficient work actually live in the visual layout because we can really see what we're doing and we can connect things quickly. So we're able to kind of get to the part where we can play um, a little bit faster. Um, the second is stability as a performance peace of mind. And as I was getting ready today, I was kind of thinking, okay, if a band member isn't reliable, what happens, right? How many of you guys have played with a band member who shows up and doesn't know their parts, right? I mean, what ends up happening is they get replaced. And I think we find ourselves in a similar situation oftentimes when we're trying to perform live. If your software isn't stable, I mean, it's not helping you, right? There needs to be some other way that we can do it, which is another thing that Gig Performer is answering, okay? We feature uh, features for performance over recording, which again, we're going to dive into the visual elements today. And also, everyone is invited to the party at Gig Performer. We have um, OSC so that we can control external um, synthesizers, or we can actually have Lemur as one of our controls. If you're using Lemur, it's an awesome program. You should definitely check it out. Um, so this is kind of where we are at. And when we finished up last week, I left everybody with this question. Okay, it's an important question. It's how are your tools affecting your thinking and your process? So if you were with us last week, or even if you are just new to the party right now, you're jumping in, I want you to give a little bit of thoughts to this, right? How are your tools affecting 
your thinking, and your process. So if you're coming up with an answer and you want to type that in, perhaps we'll share it. Um, our tools have a huge effect on this, right? If we are working with a DAW to perform live, we are spending a DAW amount of time getting ready to do the playing. And the DAW amount of time is actually too much time because our scale hasn't been tipped to allow for that uh, practice time, for the time that it takes to actually execute things really well. All right, so if anybody has any thoughts on how your tools are affecting your thinking and your process, or if you've been thinking about that, go ahead and pop that answer in the comments. I know for me, the biggest thing that I've noticed when I've switched tools, right, because I'm a big Ableton user, also a big Gig Performer user, and now I use them together, is that for me, when I'm using Gig Performer, I actually spend just a fraction of a time getting ready to play. I would say that I probably spend only 10 to 20% of my time getting my sounds set up with the rest of the time actually spent on execution. So sometimes just a slight switch in what we're doing can have major, major effects on our outcomes, okay? So this is something I want you to be thinking about, even if you haven't thought about it yet, even if you're not quite a Gig Performer user, or maybe you are and you're still like, hey, how has Gig Performer really served me? Um, this is really important. And today we are diving into the visual elements. Now, if you're thinking, Brett, every program has visual elements, why is Gig Performer any different? Um, but I have to say, you are asking the right question. Okay, so the scales do need to be tipped, but but what is the biggest thing in a DAW that we don't need to have in live performance software? Okay, if you know the answer, let me know. If you know the answer to this question, what's the biggest thing in a DAW that we do not need to have in live performance software? Okay, if you know the answer, pop it in the comments, think about it, because the thing we don't need to have from a DAW actually frees up a ton of space on our screen, okay? And it leaves us to answer this question, which is what are we gonna do with all of that space? And actually how we answer it is really important. Troy Com Carpenter just wrote in a timeline. Yeah, man, that's, that's exactly right. We don't need a timeline, but what we do need to do is answer the question, right? What is uh, what are we going to do with all of that space? Um, and how we answer it is going to affect how we are able to work. Now, different programs have answered this in different ways, right? Ableton, which is what I absolutely love to use, has said, okay, and I know there's a timeline in Ableton. Stay with me, though. Stay with me. So Ableton has said, hey, we're going to take the space and we're going to fill it with clips. So we're going to prioritize looping. We are going to prioritize the ability to loop and play back audio. And that's one answer. But the result of that choice is when people are performing, they are looping and playing back audio. Now, is that a bad thing? Definitely not. It's just the effect of the tool. So if you're using the tool, you're going to be more prone to do that. Why? Well, because the tool makes it easy, right? Now, main stage another piece of live performance software, um, Mainstage has done uh, a similar thing, right, to Gig Performer where it says, hey, we're going to take where the timeline was and we're going to let you kind of have knobs on your screen, okay? And that has an effect, right? Easy mapping. But the thing that they didn't do is they didn't get rid of channel strips, which is really designed for live performance. Now, I actually want to share with you something from our blog, because I think just kind of getting this visual uh, visual element of it uh, can be really helpful, okay? So check this out here. When we don't get rid of channel strips, what we end up having is multiple layers, okay, to accomplish any type of parallel processing, to accomplish anything in series. We need to have all of these sends and returns. And the problem with that is it's just really mentally taxing, we have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. And again, we need to tip the balance so that we're able to play and perform live. So something that looks like this, which is a little bit more complicated maybe than it needs to be, could be as simple as that. Could be this simple. And this is what I mean when I say, how are your tools affecting your work, right? If you make it really easy, to do a specific thing, you're gonna be more likely to do it. And we wanna be aware of that as we're sort of going in uh, to the process of creating. Okay, so 
what is going on with Gig Performer, okay? Gig Performer takes us through a journey, okay? And journey is the journey of sound. And what it results in is this sort of sound funnel where we are taking the mental load off of our brain putting it into the computer and using visual elements to allow us to access only the most important parts of our live performance, right? If you're using a synthesizer, you might have 50 controls. If you see 50 controls when you're performing, that is a ton of work, a ton of work on your brain to deal with when you really should just be focusing on performance, okay? So what is this journey of sound? Okay. Well, step one in the journey of sound is that sound is created. If you're a guitar player, then you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about because you make sound first by plucking your instrument, right? But then we end up on step two. And step two is that sound is modified, right? And that might be an effects pedal or that might be the way that your amp processes the sound. And then sound is released. Now, this is the journey more or less of all sounds. And this is why the visual layout of Gig Performer makes so much sense. Because from the very root, from the very beginning of how we're taught music and how we're taught to experience and create things, what we get is this sort of pathway where things are very linear. Now, even if they're running in parallel, right? Even if you're processing two things at the same time, we're still used to sort of being like, I'm going to plug this thing into this thing. It's the most natural way for us to deal with our environment. And so it takes a ton of weight off of our brain. And it really allows us to play with intention, knowing that the things that we have put on our fingertips uh, are the things that we most want to deal with. Okay. So this is the journey of sound. Now, Gig Performer itself, okay, is used like a funnel. And if you're not using Gig Performer like a funnel, I want to encourage you to maybe start thinking about it this way, okay? But we have this, this ability to bring things down to the most essential elements, okay? So I'm going to say this is our funnel, right? We got to always have pictures here. But our funnel starts with the wiring view. And in a moment here, we're actually going to build a rack space together so you can sort of see how this works in practice. But our biggest thing, the thing with the most information is our wiring view in Gig Performer. And that's how it should be because this is where the sound creation process starts. This is where your audio is coming in. This is where your MIDI is coming in. This is where things are entering the program and we get that first portion, right? Sound is created. Um, and in this particular view, we want to see the details because we're going to be dealing with the minutia of things. We're going to be changing settings. We're going to be throwing EQs on there. We want everything at our fingertips in this phase of the creation process. So if you're a guitar player, I know we had a couple of guitarists here. I actually see Elizabeth Reed commented in and said that she is a viola player. Viola player. So we have all different instruments here, right? But if your sound is coming in, and perhaps you're somebody who deals largely with audio, you've got your audio input coming in, your sound enters, your sound is modified, your sound is sent out. But like maybe, just maybe, your sound is going through a compressor. And your compressor has attack settings. Your compressor has release settings. We've got a ratio on there. We've got all these different things. But all you care about when you perform is turning the compressor on and off. So you don't want to have to deal with all of these different parameters, all of these different things. When you're in live performance, you just want to be dealing with the essentials. Now, for MIDI, your path is going to be a little bit more complex. And the reason for that is because you may have perhaps more than one instrument, or you also maybe are dealing with layers, or maybe you're dealing with, uh, you know, something that's particularly uh, unique to your use case. Okay, so there's an additional step for people who are performing with MIDI, and that's that MIDI in blocks. We need one per layer. And I think that's done on purpose, again, because we're dealing with visual elements. In this stage of the game, the largest part of the funnel, in wiring view, we want to be able to see exactly what's going on. We want to see each split. We want to see each layer so that we know what we're dealing with, right? So we've got our MIDI coming in, and maybe that MIDI is going through a VST. Maybe that sound is being modified through another effect, or maybe it's a reverb or whatever it is. Maybe it's in the synth itself or in your uh, your instrument itself. And then your sound 
is sent out. And in this context, you might even have more robust modifiers, right? You might have like a synthesizer that has 50 controls and you're like, but I really, I really only want to deal with, um, I really only want to deal with a filter. So you don't need to see all 50 controls, right? And this is sort of our first step. We want everything on the table here. We want to be able to play. We want to be able to mix and match. But then we want to move on, and we want to move on quickly, okay? So the next step in our funnel is the panel view. Now, for those of you who have been using Gig Performer, you know that we've got widgets, and those widgets sort of allow you to control certain parameters. But this, this is what I love about, about the panel view. And the, what I love about it is that it's got a lot of bonus qualities to it. So first of all, it's limiting the load on your mind, like we talked about, right? We only want to see what we have to deal with. And more buttons is more for your brain to process. And we don't want more for our brain to process. Actually, we want to use our live performance software to push us towards virtuosity, right? And so the more we can focus on actually playing, as opposed to dealing with our software, the closer we push towards virtuosity, because Gig Performer becomes a part of your instrument. Okay, so our first benefit here is that it's it's limiting the load on our mind. It's allowing us to be part of playing the music. Okay, and the second benefit is that it's increasing the speed of your work. So once you have that front panel built, maybe your sound design journey isn't over yet, but now you know the elements that you're using. Okay, I want to say that again. Maybe your sound design journey isn't over yet, but you know the elements you're using. So in some ways, boiling it down to less options gives you more power because you're not overwhelmed with choices. Now, there are some added bonuses that I want you to think about. The first bonus is that you can easily create variations of a similar sound. So I actually did an interview very recently with a band uh, called Caffeine Kill. Um, their keyboard player, whose name is Mog, we have that interview coming out really soon. So if you are not already on our mailing list, you want to definitely make sure that you go and sign up so that you get notified when this comes out. So there are some major tips in this particular interview that I know everybody can benefit from. So, um, but what it allows you to do is easily create variations of the same sound. So that's our added bonus. And then second to that, what it allows you to do is quickly mix during rehearsal. So in your bedroom, you get a great sound. All of a sudden you're playing with the rest of the band. You need to adjust levels. You need to adjust something. Well, now you're not going in and sorting through 50 knobs on your VST. Now you're not altering individual volumes on your digital plugins. No, now you're just kind of moving a widget and you're able to do it quickly. And this is another way that Gig Performer prioritizes to getting to the music. Now, last but certainly not least, okay, we have the smallest point of our funnel. And the smallest point of our funnel is our MIDI controller. Now, any MIDI controller will work, okay? I really love this one. This is what I use. This is the, uh, see if we can get it in the camera here. This is the Novation Launch Control XL. You can see I've got it all marked up. Um, this is a part of my instrument, okay? Everywhere I go, this comes with me because this is part of my instrument. But you know what I have mapped on here? Only the most important parts. So I know that I'm not getting anything extra. And that is the very, very tip of this funnel, okay? So we have started with all of the bells and whistles and we have whittled it down just to our mappings. And that's gonna allow us to be really efficient with our playing and it's gonna allow us to be really efficient even with our rehearsal process. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a moment um, to build uh, this rack space. Now, hey, if you have been getting value out of this video, if you feel like you've learned something, I want you to go ahead, hit the like button, Send us some love. If you've had an aha moment, I want you to let us know in the comments what that moment has been. What did you learn? What is noteworthy so far about what we've done? All right. So I'll go ahead and pull those up as they come in. Uh, there is a bit of a delay, but we'll, we'll get them. And in the meantime, I am going to pull up our gig performer window. So as you can see right now, I have got uh, nothing <laughs> going on. And that's because we're going to build this together. But I want us to really think about this model of a funnel. Now, my wife loves John Mayer. Uh, we listen to John Mayer all the time. It is the sound of the summer for us. <clears throat> he just came out with a new album. And so as I was getting ready for this, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to definitely kind of try and recreate uh, part of that on the live stream. So that's what we're going to do. Now, the top of our funnel, if you'll remember, is uh, in the wiring view. So I'm going to make this big so you guys can see this a little bit better. And right now you'll see that I have 
nothing in the screen, but we're going to begin to add some elements. Now, remember, we're going to start with sound coming in. We're going to modify our sound, and then we're going to send our sound out. But we want to be thinking intentionally about what it is that we want to control. So before I add any elements at all, I know that this song is going to require me to have three parts. It's going to require me to have a bass. It's going to require me to have a sort of synth horn sound. And it's going to require me to have... Um, like a little bit of extra eighth note delayed pianos. So I'm going to have three stereo channels. So I'm going to bring in a mixer to start. And if you just type in mixer eight, because as we talked about the other day, um, this sort of just will even work with strings. That is going to bring it up and you can just drop it in like this. Now, You'll notice here at the bottom, I have this little block that says two stream. That's just so you guys can hear me. This is totally not necessary. Now, here is our audio mixer. And this is going to let us eventually not have to deal with so much stuff. And again, this is because we're thinking through the lens of the funnel. How do I know what I'm going to need to access? Well, partially experience, right? But if you're thinking, hey, well, I want access to this later, it's a good idea to just put it in. Okay, so here's our audio mixer, and we are going to just quickly wire right in to our output here. So that's our audio mixer. And for now, I'm going to exit out of this because I do not need access to it. But what I do need is some MIDI in block. So again, Command P, Control P if you're on Windows. And I'm going to type in Omni because I only have one controller. So I don't need to worry about getting a specific uh, MIDI in block. And I'm going to open this up. Now, I love this MIDI in block because it gives you a ton of power. Um, and it really gives you opportunity to, like, just do exactly what you want with your incoming MIDI and not do anything else. So in this case, I'm gonna start with my bass. So what I need to do is I need to create a keyboard split because I don't want bass sounds happening up here in this part of the register because that would be not helpful. So I'm gonna go ahead here and I'm gonna map um, this upper button here by clicking learn. Um, and I'm just gonna set my highest key, which is gonna be this E flat. Okay, and actually, Naboja just wrote in. He's one of our co-founders. Notice how Brett is using shift drag to stereo connect plugins, which again, is a really quick way uh, to just make things stereo. So definitely a good tip to know if you didn't uh, know that. So we've got this in here. I've got my keyboard split. And now you'll see if I play down here, I'm getting sound and everything out here is going to be split out. So that's our MIDI in. And I'm actually going to rename this because it's going to give me clarity later. So I'm going to call this step Base. Boom. There is my MIDI in. Now, I also know that I'm going to need a layer for my right hand. So I'm going to also just create another MIDI in block by typing Omni, opening it up. And again, we have the same thing, but this time I'm going to set a lowest register. So I'll just hit A here because I know that I'm not going to be playing below that note. And then I'll unclick learn. And I'm going to rename this as well so that I know what this is called. So we'll right mouse click, we'll hit rename. I'm just going to say this RH keys. And then I'm going to do one final block because I want to have control over the octave separately. So I'll hit command P and I'll hit Omni. I'll bring this in. And what you'll notice is I've got this really easy option for transpose here. So I'm going to bring this up one octave and I'm going to just rename this octave up. Okay, so I have got three entry points as of right now. And these entry points are going to help me be able to separate out what's coming in. Now, if you saw all of this during your live performance, it would be way too much. But we're going to be able to whittle this down. So we're going to keep going here. Now, in Gig Performer, you can make favorites. And I've actually created some presets here. I'm going to walk you through them, but I'm not going to recreate them from total scratch because I think it would take up a little bit more time um, than is helpful. And if I'm going through at any point and you've got a question, feel free to let me know in the comments. Um, I can actually see everything. So if you've got a question you want answered uh, specifically around uh, visual elements, feel free to pop it in and let me know. So let's start with this step base. Now, this step base I created using pigments. And we'll wire this in. And I'm going to send this to channel one and two. Now, <clears throat> you can see I'll bring this in over the screen over here. Um, basically, what I've got going on is kind of here. Um, so 
I've got this filter that's connected to a function and I kind of wanted to have a very specific attack. So I made it in a function in pigments. I mapped it to the cutoff and that's what's creating um, sort of my step base sound, okay? And I've got this going into my audio mixer, which is gonna mean at some point I can control this volume. I never have to open the panel. I don't ever have to look at this sound again. All I have to do is go in to my uh, audio block. All right, we've got Troy Carpenter who just wrote in. This is exactly what I was missing. One MIDI block per layer. I was using one MIDI block per input. Great tip. Yeah, this can be really helpful. This is a really effective way to see what you're doing, okay? So we've got this going in here. Now I'm gonna set up my right hand keys in the same fashion. Now, <clears throat> the second layer is a horn sound, kind of like a horn slash string synth thing. And for this, I actually created it using Reason, which I'm a huge fan of Reason, and they've uh, done kind of a good thing in uh, letting it be used um, inside other programs. So this is kind of a lot to look at. So I'm gonna go in and change the max audio channels to two. So it's a bit faster and we'll run right hand in just like this and then we'll run stereo here. Now I'll show you what I've done. This is created using subtractor. And all that's really happening is, is I've got a filter that's being controlled by an envelope. So you're slowly hearing that sound begin to open. And if I change that envelope, right, like if I made this attack time less, it would really affect the sound differently, okay? So I know that's going to be something that I want to have access to later. So I'm already kind of thinking, okay, how am I going to whittle this down? Because when you look at all of these elements, that's a ton to look at. You don't want to have to deal with all of that. Okay, so we've got reason going in here. This is our brass hits. And so far, this is what we have. We've got our... Here. And this is sort of the, the foundation of the song. Okay, but right now I kind of find the sound a little bit boring. It's a little bit uninteresting. And so what I kind of thought is, well, how can we step this sound up? And Gig Performer makes it pretty easy and pretty fast. So uh, let's see here. We actually just have a question popped in. So we wrote Gig Performer. Is it possible to use Gig Performer as a VST? Uh, thinking both Live Record and GP4 as a chain controller. So um, unfortunately, this is not available. However, there is a great article on the Gig Performer blog that walks you through uh, sending audio to other programs from Gig Performer um, using Black Hole. So if you're on a, a Mac machine, that's really applicable. I know there are, are ways to do it with Windows, but I am not a Windows expert, so I uh, can't speak too much to that. But if you're kind of looking for that, um, you can route audio. Yeah, Naboja just wrote in, um, not as a VST directly, but you can route its audio into a DAW, which by the way, is a really awesome thing to do. I do this often um, because my sounds are all in Gig Performer now. So if I wanna record them, I have to route the audio. Okay. So let's go back here. I wanna show you how easy it is to make these favorites easily accessible. So for my upper layer here, I wanna have the giant, okay, piano, but I don't wanna necessarily have to access this every time. So what I'll do is I'll come in here and I'm gonna pull the giant in and I know that I kind of want this tone to be hard and I want uh, a pretty decent sized reverb on it. So that's it. I kind of made my sound. Where'd it go here? I lost contact. That's okay. We'll try one more time. Here it is. The giant. We'll alter the sound a bit. Okay. So here's my contact. And I'm going to rename this just so I know what it is. We'll call it piano. Now, if I want this to come up quickly next time, what I'll do is I'll just choose Save as Favorite, and I'll give it a name like Piano uh, Tin. Now, if I type in Piano, it pops up, and I don't have to make that um, sound again. Um, Elizabeth Reed just wrote in, can you use loopback as well? Elizabeth, absolutely you can use loopback. Um, it's a really great option if that's something that you're using. Um, okay. 
So there's contact. Now I'll know for next time. Okay, so we're going to route that to the octave up, but I also know that I want this to sort of have uh, a delay, an echo. So I'm going to pull in here my serum effects, which I really love just because it's, it's very fast to use. Um, I love the, the layout of this in general. I'm going to pull in a delay. I know that I want it to be a ping pong. I know that I want it to be 16ths. We'll do the same. Feedback. Here's my mix. And now we're just going to connect this. So piano will go here. We'll route this to three and four. Okay, so this is our element. Let's actually... Okay, so we've got some sounds here. Now, just from this, we, we're seeing a lot right now, but we're just at the tip of the funnel, right? This is the place where we see the most information, but we're going to begin to whittle things down, and we're going to do that by using widgets. Now, widgets are super powerful, but they're also super simple, and I actually think the simplicity is what makes it so powerful. So let's have a look here. We're at the front panel, and just for like a quick like super master tip here, um, if you do inside of Gig Performer, hit Command T, that's going to toggle you back and forth. So that's a really nice thing to be able to do. Um, but let's go ahead and create something that allows us to access the most important parts of what we've done. So we know we're going to need volume, right? So I'm going to go ahead and put a volume slider in here. Now, there is a trick where you can hold down three, and it'll drop three in automatically. Or if you hit it twice, it'll drop them in vertically. <clears throat> but I actually think what I'm doing right now is faster. I'm going to show you why in a second. So for each of these parameters, I know that I'm going to want to have control over volume. And then maybe I'll want to have control over one more element. Okay. So I'm going to have a knob here just for control over one more element. And I know, again, since this is visual elements, I want it to kind of pop in a way that allows me to see it. So I'm going to add a shape. I'm going to send this to the background because I want my other things to be on top. There we go. Now, this didn't go all the way back. Let's see here. Send to back. Okay. So this is going to allow me to really clearly see what's going on. So I'm going to make this round. And the fill color is good. So, so far, I have this idea happening. And if I just go like this and hit Command D, I now have a second panel and a third panel. Now I can quickly go in here. I can change this color. We'll change it to red. Can change this color. Boom. Okay. So now we have just the essentials. Now, friends, when you look at this, when you look at this, and then you look at this, we're seeing that there's a lot less to deal with. Your brain is going to interpret this way faster than it's going to interpret this. And this is by design. Okay. So mapping is really easy. If we go into our plugin parameters, we are going to see um, that we have all of these options. Now, our audio mixer is what we want first. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to choose channel one and two volume for this guy. If you want to relabel this and call this bass, you can do that. Makes it really easy. Um, now we'll just click here. We're going to do the same thing for our mixer. We're going to choose three and four. And we'll go over here and we're going to choose three and four as well. Now, uh, four, five, five and six. All right. Now, if you've gotten any insight out of this, if you feel like you are going to change what you're doing, let us know how you're going to do it a little bit differently in the comments. We'd love to hear what you're thinking. Now, for my bass sound, I think it would be nice to have control over the filter. So we're going to do this. Let's head into this, this knob here, and we know that we created the bass sound using pigments. Okay, So I can choose Learn Parameter, and it's going to automatically pop this open for me. And I'm just going to click on this button. Now, if you look here, you've got Hertz displaying. So now, when I come in here and I exit edit mode, this is going to change. The cutoff of my filter. And it's going to make it so that if I want to tweak something, it's immediately at my fingertips. Okay? Now, this guy over here, you can also rename the channels of the mixer. Yes, this is an awesome tip. Let me actually demo how that's done. So if you open this up and you click here, it's going to give you the option to rename step, base, 
keys. Ah, uh, this is synth. This is keys. And this will actually do, when you go into mapping, it'll name what you've named it. So this is actually a very helpful tip. Um, OK, so um, synth volume, I actually also am going to want a control over my filter. So I'll go in here. I'll give this a wiggle. And you'll see it's mapped. So now I have control over that. And then for my keys, I think really what I want is actually not in the keys itself, but I'm going to want to have control over the wet dry of my, uh, my delay. So now what I've done is I've made it so that I can go in here and say, hmm, my bass is too loud or too quiet. Now, something else I think is really important. Let's see here. Glencher, I still find it difficult to read the vertical text in the front on mixers. I still find it difficult to read the vertical text and that font on the mixers while working in wiring view. Any plans to address this? Interesting question. So <clears throat> my guess is the easiest way for you to handle this, Glenn, is to label things. We can actually do it with tape. Um, I'm not sure if anything's in production here, but if I were to label this whatever I wanted, I could make this font size as big as I want. And I think that that's probably the easiest way for you to handle it for now. Uh, I know maybe that's a bit of a Band-Aid, but um, <clears throat> that, that's what I would say to it. Okay, so we've got all of these elements. And one thing here that's really important is you can set ranges so that you never go too high or too low. So if you want, for example, to never go above zero dB, um, I just happen to know that that's 70.7. So we can do it and then we'll always end up at zero. Okay, um, so let's see. We've got another question coming in. Trying to figure out a lot of what I will need at once budgetarily. Are there automation controls like in a DAW for CC in audio modeling VSTs? Are there automation controls like in a DAW for CC in audio modeling VSTs? It's a good question. So if I understand you correctly, you want the automation of CCs to be played back. And if that's the case, um, what I would say is you can create a, a MIDI recording and run it through MIDI file player. Um, but if that's not your question, maybe rephrase that and then we can, we can try again. Okay, so we've gotten to the middle right now, right, of our setup. And the next part is mapping, okay? And mapping is also really easy. So if I click in here, it's going to give me an option to MIDI map, right? So if I choose learn, I can move a, a fader, and that's it. It's done. Now, we also have a rig manager, which can be really helpful if you end up moving between uh, rigs at different times. But I would say in about 10 to 12 minutes, we've just created a patch, okay? And this is going to work now for this song. And I'm going to have the ability to really go in here and tweak the volume. So on my end, my bass is way too loud. My synth is a bit loud here. Maybe want a little bit more dry wet. And now as I'm editing, I'm really only dealing with the elements that I need to be dealing with. So I've completely eliminated any strain on my mind. And I'm really allowed to sort of focus in um, on exactly what we're doing. Now, this is kind of where we're at. Again, if you've ever had any aha moments, let us know. But I kind of want to cast our vision a bit forward here. Actually, one other thing before we go. Uh, we want to talk about variations. So what we can do is we can create a new variation. And we'll call this maybe a down section. And what this will allow me to do is sort of create different variations of the sound. So if in the beginning, I want this sound to be maybe loud, but when I come here, I want it to be lower. I can just make that adjustment. Maybe that's too low. Maybe I want the filter to be slightly more open. So now as I'm going through, I can even begin to create my song parts again using just the absolute essentials. Um, 
Okay, so I want to open up the floor here for questions, uh, maybe about sort of the, the funnel or maybe about something specific. Um, Secret, I see your comment. I'm going to go ahead and bring you in a second. But if you have any questions, how can I utilize this to maybe um, make what I'm doing better? Pop it in the comments. We're going to answer them. We'll talk a little bit next week before we wrap it up. So uh, audio modeling is a brand of physically modeled instruments, right? They require CC expression. I'm wondering if I can set up automation in advanced. Um, so let's see here. Um, CC 11 to your plugins before play. I see. So um, Naboja, if you want to answer that in the comments, that may be more your uh, your speed here. So Mark wrote in this cool, and actually we've got an interview with this guy that was unbelievable. You're definitely gonna wanna check it out. Um, so he just wrote in what's really cool is when you map these widgets to a MIDI controller and have hands-on control in real time. Yeah, gig performer becomes your instrument, friends. And that's what's so sort of captivating about this. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, design mode, send to back on tab. As it stands, it's only available on right click as opposed to menu. Sometimes I find it hard to move the correct object forward or backwards. That'd be of great help. Yes, that's a great suggestion. And by the way, if you're watching this and you're not a member of our community forum, definitely go become a member of our community forum or join us on our Facebook group because this is like a, you know, a feature request so that we have a place to process them. We want to hear your, uh, your voices. Okay. Um, friends, thank you so much for being here. I want you guys to make sure you are back next week because we're going to do a deep dive specifically into widgets. I'm actually going to hold maybe just for like 30 more seconds to see if any more questions come in. Um, but if not, um, then we'll wrap up for today. Um, secret, you know, if you're not a member of our Facebook group or our forum, um, go ahead and post this question there because I know we'll be able to help you a little bit more easily in that context. Um, all right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I wanna leave you with this final question, okay? I want you to think about this because next week when we come back, I'm gonna ask, I wanna hear your answers because I wanna just be able to see how you guys are growing. And this is the question that I wanna leave you with. I wanna say, how can you use the funnel approach to make your sound design faster? because we wanna move from sound design into playing. So how can you use this thinking to make the preparation part shorter so you can get to playing? I'm gonna ask you guys next week. I want you to think about it. Um, and I will see you all next week, Thursday, 1 p.m. Gig Performer backstage for our deep dive in widgets. All right, thank you so much for being here. See you all next time.